Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to round table. Uh, let me start the screen. Well, as you can see from the as you can see from the screen, round table is about discovering truth one question at a time. Uh, we are passionate to equip Christians to engage with the big questions in life and to help everyone discover the truth of Christianity, one question, one topic at a time. Uh, we also want to show that uh, Christians, Christian worldview is still, the very much, is still very much relevant in today's world and that it gives us the much needed resource to live a meaningful and purposeful life. Uh, Roundtable is a ministry of Cross Culture Church, which is based in Melbourne, Australia. And tonight, I want to also extend my welcome to those who log in from outside of Victoria, Australia. Some are from interstates, and uh, I know at least one person logging in from Vietnam and another from the United States. So welcome to all of you. And for those of you who have attended Roundtable last year, well, you will have a very different experience today. Uh, due to COVID-19, we are now running Roundtable webinar style, uh, rather than face-to-face -face sitting on physical round tables. Uh, so unfortunately, there will be no group or table discussions tonight, uh, but I still hope that we can have some level of interactions, and I sure hope that you will still benefit from Roundtable this evening. So a few housekeeping matters. Um, uh, please use the Q&A uh, window to ask your questions. Uh, the chat window is also open, so feel free to, if you want to, maybe send messages around. Um, but if you want to ask your question, please use the Q&A window. Um, we will try to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, so feel free to send your question anytime during the talk, anytime during the night. Uh, but of course, time is limited, so not all questions will be answered. Uh, but if you ask your question, now there's option to ask your question anonymously. Um, but if you, so if you ask your question not anonymously uh, and your question is not able to be answered tonight, we will endeavor to get back to you offline after the session tonight. So you have the option to ask your question anonymously or not anonymously. So feel free to choose whichever way you want. All right, so well, it is my pleasure now to welcome and introduce uh, Pastor Murray Campbell. Uh, Pastor Murray, welcome to Roundtable. Uh, great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, let me ask you a few questions just for us to get to know you a little bit. Uh, apart from what we have mentioned from the poll just now, could you tell us a bit more about yourself? Sure. Well, I, I thought the name of my blog was Play Your Guitar With Murray. So I, I, I got that one wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, apart from that, uh, I, I, in fact, I don't play the guitar at all. Uh, yeah, okay. So my name's Murray. Uh, I'm married. I've been married for 21 years to Susan, and we have uh, three children. Uh, we have a, a boy in year 10 at school, uh, another son who is in year eight, and a daughter who is finishing up primary school, grade six at the moment. Uh, and I've been serving at, as a pastor here at Mentone Baptist Church for the last 15 or so years. All right. Thanks so much for that, uh, Murray. And uh... When I check out your blog, your, it also says that you're actually uh, a classical pianist. So, wow, that's that's amazing. So maybe uh, next time when you present, you should play a bit <laughs> of your piano as well. <laughs> anyway, uh, what are your most and least favorite things during this lockdown? Uh, sure. Uh, most favorite? Uh, I guess I'm an introvert, so I quite enjoy time by myself or just at home with, with the family. And, and so that, I guess... Uh, helps in, in, in a context like this. So I, I've enjoyed yeah, a bit of quiet time, I must say. Um, the, the things that I've least liked, uh, one, I, I really do miss uh, church. I really miss seeing my congregation, um, you know, in person every week uh, and, and desperate to get back to, to seeing them again. Um, and I also just miss seeing my kids play sport. My kids love sport. And uh, it, it's something that we do all the time, or rather they would be doing all the time. And so just being outdoors and watching them compete and, and play and enjoy that. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely missing that as well. Mm, yep, yep. 
yeah, definitely missing church. I think ministry is quite challenging during this time. So we do miss that face-to-face -face interaction. So I guess uh, what will be the first thing, the first thing you look forward to doing once this phase of lockdown is over? The first thing. Oh, well, it's the same answer probably as the previous question. First thing, I want to be at church. Uh, and second, uh, to be watching my kids play sport again. Looking forward to that. Cricket season uh, should have start. Well, starts in a couple of months, so we've got a bit of time. But yeah, looking forward to that. That's awesome. I think the first thing that I look forward to is going to get a Vietnamese coffee with a uh, with a big roll of banh mi. Woohoo! Anyway. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Mari, and uh, I hope that uh, helps people to get to know you a bit more. Uh, so I'll pass the time now to you. Um, just to remind you guys again, uh, feel free to send your question through the Q&A window, uh, be it anonymously or not anonymously, okay? Thanks, Mari. No worries, thanks, Sandy. Uh, if you have a Bible nearby, you might grab, want to uh, grab it and, and open it to Matthew chapter 24. I'm gonna be looking at it uh, a bit later on. Uh, what we're doing though, uh, we've, I'm dividing the presentation into two parts. We're gonna have a short break in the, in the middle. Um, the first part is, of the presentation is longer, so just letting you know, uh, there's three points we're gonna cover there. And then in part two, we're gonna deal with the fourth and final point. Now, I just wanna begin though by talking about uh, the idea of uh, apocalypse or apocalyptic. Uh, I don't need to tell you, 2020 is proving to be one of the strangest years most of us have lived through. Uh, the language of apocalyptic has been used in the media more times than I can count. Uh, you know, talking about the end of the world was once associated with religious mania. But today there, there are throngs of irreligious people who are also joining in this chorus and, and using this uh, uh, word, apocalypse. And in Australia, we started the year with the worst bushfire season on record and with much talk about climate change. Uh, these conversations were soon uh, laid aside with the reality of COVID-19 uh, becoming a world pandemic. And then this virus created another plague, uh, that of economic uncertainty with you know, a staggering accumulation of, of rapid national debt and million jobs gone here in Australia alone. And of course, no one knows how long uh, this pandemic is going to go for. When will it end? Will it end? What's the final toll going to be in both at the human and the social and the economic costs? And then just over a month ago, there was the, the shocking murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Protests erupted across the United States and even here in Australia. And while there's been huge progress made since the days of old when the, you know, the white Australia policy was in place, and, and that time when Aboriginal people were not even uh, considered citizens of Australia. Much progress has been made. However, racism is sadly not just a historical thing. Now, in addition, uh, the sexual revolution is continuing uh, its erratic course. Uh, it's a bit out of sight at the moment, uh, but it, it's still there and doing its work. Uh, in particular, the transgender movement, which is requiring total allegiance and the automatic counseling of anyone who dares question their dogma. Uh, cancel culture has become a sign of the times. Now, all of these things, uh, if you're thinking that's more than enough for one year, well, it is. And we've just turned into the second half of this unforgettable year. And you know, any one of those stories could be the, the, the mark, you know, the, the stamp of what this year is about. But of course, there is more. On July 1st, our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, made a major announcement regarding an issue that um, is I still not getting the public attention it deserves. Uh, the PM gave this rare and important address regarding the defense of our country. And he announced a $270 billion investment for our military, including uh, long range ballistic missiles. And this speech is, and decision is a direct response to the growing geopolitical threat posed by communist China. On July 9th, so just a week later, the government announced uh, temporary visas for Hong Kong citizens and is now trying to welcome Hong Kong businesses to, who are looking to leave Hong Kong and, and to, to come to another country. And our government is preparing uh, ways for them to come to Australia. And we, we know already China's role in covering up the, the true extent of the coronavirus it, it, is an issue, but it's far from the worst of it. We're finally hearing those stories of a million uh, Uyghurs who are remaining locked away in re-education ca uh, camps in Northwest China. 
Christian churches are continually oppressed and Christians arrested. And yes, then there's that growing interference in Hong Kong and also the military expansion in the South China Sea, border tensions with India. When history books are written in, say, 50 years' time, of all of the, the myriad of major issues facing us this year, it probably won't be the bushfires or the race protests or transgenderism or even the pandemic that will feature. I reckon the story will be China. When it comes to China, that the language of a new Cold War is being suggested by academics around the world. Uh, Neil Ferguson, for example, he's the, the senior fellow at the, the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. In December last year, he started to argue that a new Cold War had started. He explains, quote, something changed in 2019. What had started out as a trade war, a tit for tat over tariffs, while these two sides argued about the American trade deficit and Chinese intellectual property theft, rapidly metamorphosed into a cluster of other conflicts. In short order, the United States and China found themselves engaged in a technology war over the global dominance of the Chinese company, Yahweh, um, in, in 5G network telecommunications, and an ideological confrontation in response to the abuses of Uyghur Muslim minorities, as well as a classic superpower competition for primacy in science and technology." Unquote. Now, if a new Cold War hasn't already descended, I think it's clear that the, the falling autumn leaves are, are, are certainly happening and the temperature is dropping, that there is a winter coming. And the next few years are going to be pivotal in determining how cold or how hot this geopolitical standoff will become. Now, as we enter the, the second half of this strangest of, of years, I, I'm praying, one of the things I'm praying is that Australians will wake up and understand that what we assumed was normal and secure about life isn't so certain and reliable. We need to anchor our life and, and our hope in something that is better than the health or prosperity that we've been gorging on for so many decades. And so there is this, this question, isn't there? As Christians, how do we understand what's going on in the world? As a Christian, I'm not simply looking at events and considering them from a social or political point of view. We need to do that. But we also want to think about them theologically and ask ourselves, well, how does the Bible inform us and help us to think through these issues? At the start of the year at Mentone, we were preaching through those final chapters of Matthew's gospel. Uh, in chapter 24, we read Jesus's famous apocalyptic sermon. And at the time, his message struck home. And, and even since, I found his words incredibly helpful. Um, and what, what I want to do um, now is to give us a snapshot of Jesus's sermon and then show us how, to be, how we can be uh, thinking through issues that are facing us as we listen uh, to Jesus's words. So we're going to spend a bit of time doing that now. Now, the first point I want us to, to, to bring to your attention from Genesis, uh, sorry, from uh, Matthew 24 is this, the world is fallen and people remain sinful. The world is fallen and people remain sinful. Now, in this apocalyptic sermon, Jesus is not giving us a, a linear description of history as though he's saying, this is what will happen in 54 AD and this is what will happen in 300 AD and then 1557 and 2020. And rather what Jesus is doing, he is giving us a divine interpretation of history. And he's describing those things that we ought to expect in the world until the return of the king. So, in, for instance, Jesus says oh, there's going to be global catastrophes and conflicts. So in verses six and seven. Jesus says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is yet to come. Nations will, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. So Jesus anticipates there will be conflict in the world. Conflict that's brought about by nations and also natural disasters. You see, COVID-19 didn't take God by surprise. The rise of communist China is not happening outside of God's line of sight. And when we see a disaster, I think it should make us pause and ponder. I mean, even when the sky darkens and the thunder's rolling in, we often look up and we ask, what of the end? 
Now, these things are not the end, but they serve as reminders that the world has not yet finished. Now, Jesus not only talks about the world in general, but he's also shedding light on conflict in the church. He talks about attacks on the church from both outside and from within. Jesus speaks about persecution, false prophets and apostasy. So I'm going to just read from verse 9. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, again, we're not required to read these verses as though Jesus is describing a not yet time in the future. Or even as though Jesus is suggesting there's going to be an escalation of these things just prior to his coming back. But rather, Jesus is describing the age in which we live. And he's describing what churches will experience in this time. So Jesus' first, first point there is he's telling us what the world will be like. It remains fallen and people remain sinful. Second, we're not the first generation to face significant crises. We're not the first generation to face significant crises. In February this year, I wrote an article that was criticizing the Victorian government's plan to ban conversion practices. Now, depending on what is meant by that, that phrase, you know, conversion practice, um, this may be something that churches object to. But the government is proposing a definition that is so broad that when they ban conversion practices or conversion therapy, what they will likely do is prohibit normal Christian teaching on the Bible about marriage and sexuality and even prayer. So if you were getting alongside someone in your church who was same-sex attracted and they asked for prayer so that they remain godly and abstinent, right? If you prayed for that, that they would be godly, that could fall foul of this forthcoming legislation. It is quite extraordinary and extreme. In fact, in June, the state government renewed its commitment to introducing the ban this year. So stay tuned for uh, news to come out about it. Now, anyway, at the time, I was writing an article about it in February, and there were thousands of people looking at this, this piece that I put together, and hundreds and hundreds of comments were being made on social media, and one of the, it was interesting, one of the more popular responses coming from Christians were with, with comments like, well, this proves Jesus is coming back soon. Or this is a sign of the end times. Or even this, the Antichrist has appeared in Melbourne. Now, these comments reminded me, you know, not only do we, what happens when we, we let our imaginations disconnect from the Bible, but also when we allow our imaginations to disconnect from history. At the time, I was wanting to uh, post an emoji with a screaming face on it saying, no, you've misunderstood me. You know, some of the, I, I get, the problem with some of our apocalyptic speech that comes from Christians is, is this really strange belief, which is now we are living in the last times. We're really living in the last times as opposed to last week or last year or 10 years ago. In fact, I think this is one of the reasons why we uh, need to study history at school. Because, you see, ours is not the first generation to experience massive issues and to see terrible evil. The world has faced enormous mountains of trouble and uncertainty before. I mean, what, what of Jewish people living in Poland in 1939 as, as the Nazis destroyed everything in their wake? What about a Jewish family who were in hiding and the SS were hunting them down and, 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 and destroying and killing their neighbours and friends, you know, shooting them dead on the spot or, or throwing them into a train bound for a death camp? Could things get any worse than that? Or what about those who were living in the 14th century in Europe as the Black Plague killed one third of the continent's population? Could things be any worse than that? Or what about the millions who were fleeing from Genghis Khan, who killed population after population across Asia and Europe? Could things get any worse than that? 
So we mustn't think that what we're experiencing this year is entirely new or that somehow it is more the last days than the, what other generations have faced. What we're experiencing this year is as old as the fall itself. You know, most Aussies, not all, but most of us have been living in this luxurious bubble that few people in the world enjoy, let alone in history. Now, there are major issues facing us that we need to deal with. But I think at the very least, when reading Jesus' words should cause us to rethink our assumptions about our own security and dependencies in life. Now, in Jesus' sermon, he only gives one sign for his impending return. You see that the word apocalyptic, um, I'm sure you, you may be familiar with it, uh, but the word means unveiling. It is to make something known that was previously unknown. Now, the, the great unveiling concerns the time and manner in which the world is going to wrap up and the new creation is revealed. And so as Jesus is talking about this question of apocalypse, he's ex he explains to his disciples that there is only one sign. And that sign is his return. So we read in verses 30 and 31. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. So there is one sign, and the sign is visible, unavoidable, and unmistakable. And Jesus adds, and people will mourn. Why? Because people have spent their days denying him, explaining away the reality of Jesus. But in contrast, to those whom Jesus describes here as the elect, he says throughout the sermon, he says, stand firm, verse 13. Keep watch, verse 4. Don't grow cold, verse 12. Don't get sucked in by false teaching, verses 23 and 24. Now, as we look at this year so far, in, in light of scripture, what we're seeing is that the world is fallen and people are sinful we see that we are not the first people who are facing significant health, social, and political issues. And this is not the first time that churches are being attacked by false teaching. There's a, a third point that Jesus establishes in this apocalyptic sermon, and it's this. God is sovereign. Despite the uncertainties that we're feeling and experiencing and seeing this year, God remains sovereign. And in Matthew 24, Jesus gives us three indications of God's sovereignty. I mean, number one, Jesus is explaining what the world will be like with great accuracy, isn't he? And second, Jesus accurately describes the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. And thirdly, Jesus can also speak about that very end of history with his triumphal return. These are wonderful reminders of that God is sovereign and is in full control and has full knowledge of what's going on in the world. Now, when is that final hour going to strike? Well, no one knows that time or hour when Jesus will return. Uh, Jesus makes it plain in the sermon. He says, you don't know. Only God, the Father knows. Like verse 42. He says to us, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And he also says this, see to it that you are not alarmed. We shouldn't be alarmed. We shouldn't be surprised by events that take hold of, of people and of nations and of the world. Now, we can be appalled by these things. We can grieve these sharp reminders of a world that's cursed and can't save itself. Alarmism, though, however, isn't befitting for someone who trusts in a God who is sovereign. And Jesus is offering a profound comfort here, isn't he? Now, I get it. It's hard to get our minds around this year, isn't it? Major bushfires, global pandemic, significant economic pressures, jobs insecurity, uh, religious freedom issues, the beginning of a new Cold War, which may or may not turn hot in the next few years. I mean, all these things are major issues. Jesus says, 
don't be alarmed. God is not taken by surprise. He hasn't lost his grip. These things must take place, he says. And so this apocalyptic sermon is reinforcing one of those great Bible themes that events in our time are not beyond God's knowledge or control. He, God is not reacting to events as though he's trying to play catch up. He knows what will happen tomorrow. He knows the outcome before the event because he's omniscient and omnipotent. I mean, surely that's great comfort. I may not know what will happen tomorrow. You may not know whether it's about the virus or the weather or our work or exams or whatever, but God has it all under his control. And it's pointing ultimately to the return of our Lord and Saviour. Let's get a, we're going to take a break now uh, for a couple of minutes. Just pause. I know I've just been uh, dumping a lot, a lot of information uh, there and, and uh, stuff from Matthew 24. But what we're going to do now, I believe, is have a, a two-minute break. And there are two poll questions which Sandy has put up on the screen, which you'll be able to see. And uh, you might want to answer those questions. What do you think are the most significant challenges facing our society today? What are the reasons for thinking this? And what are the most important issues facing churches in Australia today? In fact, that's, that's a question that I'm going to address in, in the second part, but love to hear uh, your thoughts and answers. So let's take a two minute break interval and then we'll start again. Just looking at the answers so far and some great uh, comments and, and responses. Very good. I suspect we will be, I'll, I'll be addressing a couple of them 
in this second part, but uh, feel free to ask questions about those issues if you like later on. All right, let's get started for the second part. The, the fourth point that I want us to uh, spend some time with um, for Matthew 24 is this. The preaching of the gospel remains the church's mission. The preaching of the gospel remains the church's mission. So if you look at verse 14, and uh, I'll read it for us. Jesus says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So in the world, and this is really important, Jesus is describing, which sounds very much like the, the world that we're living in today, he speaks of a message that is to be preached to the nations. There is one good news message, one gospel that is to be preached to the whole world. And so, and this gospel is our message to the nations, isn't it? Paul, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, today is the day of salvation. That's one of those verses that I like to remind myself of uh, quite frequently. Today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 2. So this is the age in which God is bringing salvation through the gospel. So Paul's point and Jesus's point are the same. This is the time in which God is bringing salvation through the gospel. God remains sovereign and the gospel remains good true and powerful. God is perfectly able to, to grow his kingdom around the world, even here in Australia, beyond my expectations and even my prayers. God's not bound by our glass half empty views or pessimism you know, as we're looking at our troubled world. You know, as people wake up to the fact that we don't have all of the answers and as we learn from a pandemic, we can't control tomorrow. I think there is a growing sense of frustration and even despair and even before the pandemic with the issues of bushfires and climate change we know that especially amongst millennials there is a, a growing sense of despair and depression and hopelessness people are asking questions you know what we assumed was certain and reliable is far from that there are people who are looking for a certain hope and of course, God in his grace has given us his gospel, which is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. This good news is hope. And so the task for the church is to preach this gospel of Jesus. In a times of uncertainty, in times of, of, of evil, in times of despair, Jesus reminds us the gospel is to be preached throughout the world. And I want to make three points about this. Number one, as churches, we need gospel conviction. We need gospel conviction. So the, the message that you talk about most is the one that you're most passionate about. It's the message that you turn to for hope. It's the message that's front and center in your church. I wonder what, what, what message are you relying on to keep yourself going in the Christian life? What message are you relying on to, to keep your, the, the church united and growing? The message we speak and the ministries we use reveal what our deepest convictions are, what we ultimately trust. Now, my expectation is, apart from the grace of God, what we believed prior to the pandemic is what we will carry through to us with us to the other side. Now, that's great if, if we've got a gospel vision, but it's a huge problem if we don't. I think one of our challenges is not that we don't believe the gospel, but that we don't believe the gospel is sufficient. We're not convinced that it's truly powerful and sufficient. Yeah, our practices can often betray what we think we believe. An obvious, obvious example of this is, is a way many churches uh, in, in, the, in the West in particular, but in other parts of the world, how many churches rely on consumer techniques when you're organizing your church and when you're organizing the kinds of ministries that you, you will do as a church. 
it's, it's a constant battle. You know, consumerism and obstinate individualism are so deeply ingrained in our culture here in Australia that it weaves its way into Christian attitudes toward Christianity and, and the church. But you see, consumerism asks the wrong sets of questions and it puts faith in the wrong answers. Consumerism works against discipleship. It works against long-term committed members. And instead, it creates short-term attendees and these parasitic Christians who think Christianity and church has just got to be done on their terms. I'll be part of this so long as it meets my needs. And the church's manual for doing ministry becomes some sort of you know, poor version of Vogue magazine or Netflix, when it should be instead the word of God and church covenants. Even with our online you know, Zoom uh, meetings that many churches are doing on Sundays, we can reinforce the, the consumer mindset or we can try to break with the culture by doing things differently. And by different, I'm not arguing that we do things poorly, but I'm talking about doing things with simple faithfulness, simple faithfulness that is driven by core gospel principles. And these include making disciples, the centrality of reading and preaching the word of God, preaching the whole counsel of God, permeating everything with prayer, and having gatherings of God's people more about congregational participation rather than upfront performance. This is a great opportunity for churches to pause and ask, what are our convictions? What's driving us? The way we do church, the, the way we're doing our ministries. We need gospel convictions. And second, let's work on gospel clarity. Now, when churches are finally able to meet up again in person and ministries start up again, uh, most churches will not look the same that they did in February. Very few churches, I suspect, will be able to return to what they were doing in February, just, you know, five, six months ago. There are going to be constraints put us, and that's not entirely bad. For example, they're going to be financial constraints. Likelihood is most churches are going to have to live leaner, and more focused. And that means what we need to do, and again, this is an opportunity, we can reconfigure our mission and our ministry priorities. It's a great time to be asking and for leaders and churches to be thinking through this. What is this church about? What is our mission? How can we best arrange gospel priorities with our new and restricted budget? And it's not just about having limited financial means, but many of our people are going to be exhausted and, and not having either the emotional um, energy or mental capacity just to jump back in and do lots of ministry. You know, research is showing that during this pandemic, large numbers of, of practicing Christians are dropping out of their local church or even leaving Christianity altogether. Uh, one set of research uh, coming out of Barna in, in the US has found that one in three practicing Christians in America have stopped engaging with their local church. That's huge. A third of practicing Christians in America. And I'm hearing similar stories in Australia. Now, when, when we finally start gathering again in, who knows, four months, six months time, whenever it is, I, I suspect a lot of churches are going to be smaller and more local with restrictions on large gatherings and with uh, people using this season to, to walk away from the faith, which is a terribly sad thing to see. And with people, I think also driving less and wanting to stay closer to their own community. I think we may see a transition toward more local church, smaller and more local. And this means that churches are going to have fewer resources, fewer members, people who are tired, Again, working with smaller budgets. And we're even going to see, I suspect, a lot of churches fast-tracked in, in terms of, of closing. And there's going to be grief. It's going to be difficult, isn't it? Now, we can view these limitations, though. We can grieve over some of these things, but we can also see them as an opportunity given to us by God to sharpen our focus and to be more clear about the gospel. And then third and finally, we need gospel courage. 
We mustn't think Christianity, I think, is going to be, uh, become popular all of a sudden. The context into which Jesus preaches his apocalyptic sermon is one where there is open hostility to the gospel and to the church. Jesus says, assume there is going to be hostility and opposition. Assume there is going to be conflict in between nations and natural disasters, that these things are going to happen. But amongst all of that, in the middle of that, he says, and the gospel is going to be preached to the nations and people are going to be saved. Now, time will tell whether this pandemic starts a revival or we see perhaps instead Christianity pushed further aside. History shows us that when significant social events take place, they rarely create the ground for revival or a great influx of people returning to churches. If we just look at the last century or so, if two world wars didn't achieve a revival or the Great Depression, or the threat of nuclear war, or September 11, or the 2008 stock market crash. They didn't cause societal attitudes toward Christianity to improve. So why do we think this most current crisis will be any different? We mustn't put our hope in global events, but put our hope in Christ, no matter the season we find ourselves living in. I think there are certain trends emerging in our culture that suggest it's going to be harder for Christians and for churches in Australia. At the same time, people in our communities are more fearful, anxious, asking questions. Take initiative. Offer the good news of Jesus Christ. If people are fearful, let's offer his comfort. If people are looking for hope, present the secure hope that we have in Jesus. You see, in an apocalyptic age, this is our mission. I just want to finish up with a few verses from Colossians chapter 4. At church, we're currently uh, preaching through Colossians. And uh, this coming Sunday, I'm going to be expounding this very passage. So that's why it's on my mind at the moment. Uh, but I think there, there, it's an appropriate place to conclude. Paul says to the church in Colossae, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Mari, for uh, helping us uh, thinking through uh, all these different issues that we're going through. And uh, I really appreciate um, uh, I really appreciate the fact that you put it, put, put, put our perspective in the right place. That this, this is not the worst. I mean, as in, as in, this pandemic or this uh, crisis, this crisis has happened before. And sometimes we think that why it happens in our lifetime, you know. But it happens in almost every lifetime, and mm. uh, it's good to help that you help us uh, put our perspective in the right place. And then I, I resonate uh, with one comment uh, by someone that says that, uh, wow, when you outline all the challenges and complex issues facing our world at the moment, it does seem overwhelming. So it does seem overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, but also it's good that we have a good and sovereign God who is in charge and can work all things for our good and for his glory. Indeed. So, uh, there are a few questions that have come in. Uh, so let me start with this one. Uh, when churches are allowed to go back to normal, how should we think through whether it is wise to continue keeping our online services running? So when churches are allowed to go back to normal, how should we think through whether it's wise to continue keeping our online services running? Sure. Good question. Uh, it's a question that uh, the elders here at Mentone have uh, discussed uh, as well. Um, and I think our thinking uh, is... I mean, we don't, the, the church is the physical gathering of the people of God who are covenanted together um, in that, that place, that, that, that specific you know, location and, and congregation. 
Um, and, and so uh, we want to, when we're allowed to meet again in, in that same physical space, uh, we want to encourage people to return um, as quickly as they feel comfortable to do so. Um, so our long-term plan is not to keep um, having sermons. Well, we might leave sermons up on, on YouTube, but um, we, we, will, we don't want to have a service online, let's say. In fact, we're not even doing a service at the moment online. We, we, we have things on a Sunday morning. We have prayers and Bible readings, um, but we're not trying to replicate church. Um, at, I know a lot of churches are. We're not doing that. That's partly because we're wanting to um, make our people hungry you know, and desperate to get back to church. Um, so I think long term, I, I think it's un, it'd be unhelpful to ha have online services. Um, it makes, I think, uh, lazy, can make lazy Christians. And, uh, and when, and, and it actually, I think, defeats the purpose or even the, the, the definition of church, what we have in the scriptures. You've got to be together in, in, in person. Now, we might leave something on, on YouTube for a period of time after we've gone back for out, out of love for a few people who may not be comfortable. I understand there may be people who are fearful to come back um, to be, you know, close with one another. And, and so in order to serve them for a period of time, we might still have something available online, but our long-term strategy is, is to, to, to get rid of that because we know what church means. It is to be together uh, in the same physical space and so we want to return to that as quickly as possible. But I understand there are other churches who, who, that will come to two different conclusions. Mm, all right. Uh, thank, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, another question. Um, I think you mentioned about the gospel conviction, gospel clarity, and gospel courage, which I believe whether it is in pandemic, pre-pandemic, or post-pandemic, we need the three things all the time. So I'm just thinking, uh, what will be, it will, do you sense any difference on those about, about those three points post this pan, this particular pandemic uh, is there any difference at all or, or or is it more like a we just keep doing these three things uh, but is there is there anything different with the covid uh, you, you know what i mean sure i mean there obviously are differences you know there there uh, i don't there, i don't think there are any theological differences uh, i don't think the the mandates in in the bible are any different but this, our circumstances that have changed uh, and are changing, you know, quite significantly. Um, I think gospel courage, I, I th uh, one thing that might change, not because of the pandemic, but possibly because of issues of freedom of religion in Australia, especially in Victoria. It, again, if this legislation about uh, gay conversion therapies is passed in, in the parliament this year, which is the intention, um, it could be against the law to preach on certain parts of the Bible, to preach from a, a Christian perspective. Um, that is not out of the question. Uh, now, the government may come to realise that they need to change their definition of conversion practices and make it a, a narrow definition rather than a broad one. But under the definition they're currently proposing, uh, churches could easily get in trouble for what, for what we teach about marriage and sexuality, for what we pray for people in regard to marriage and sexuality. So uh, there is, yeah, uh, because of that issue, yeah, gospel courage for sure. Um, so that, that might be a, a new thing. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That, that might be, that might be a, that might be a topic for the next round table. <laughs> 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 we can think about that a bit more. Uh, there's another question, uh, Murray. I uh, would love to hear your comment on this. While we predict to see smaller churches after the lockdown, would it perhaps be encouraging if we can see more gatherings? That is seeing more smaller churches in Australia. Could this be potentially the start of more grassroots Christian movements and personal revivals? So I don't know if you have any comment on that. Um, yeah, my, my reason for thinking that churches, generally speaking, will become smaller uh, is twofold. One, um, over an extended period of time, there are some Christians who are just going to get uh, going to be disconnected and choose to disconnect from their local church and, and, and to leave, maybe join another church. 
uh, or, or perhaps just drop out altogether for an extended period of time, which is sad. So I think church churches are, are, are going to lose people. Um, but I, I, we're praying also that we grow and, and that people are, are wanting to, um, to find out about Jesus and it will become Christians and join our churches. Um, so, and I'm sure some of that will happen as well. Um, I'm, so my, my, my view is, is not that big church is bad and, and small church is good. I think big church can be fantastic and faithful and glorifying to God. We need big churches for, for different re- reasons, I think. And we also need small churches. Um, and, and I think they, they both can serve uh, different uh, parts of the community. They can do m- different ministries more effectively and well. Um, but I don't, I, so it, I, we don't want a big versus small sort of mentality. But I, I, but I suspect because people may leave their churches, but also because uh, we're becoming more local, you know, and, and, and living in our own little communities, People might decide, well, wouldn't it be great actually to, to, to join a church in my neighborhood rather than wherever, you know? And so I think that there, there might be some of that going on. And that the benefit of that is it might help strengthen some struggling churches, local churches. Um, but the other benefit is if you're wanting to invite a friend to church, I don't need to say to them, I'm get, it takes me three hours to get to church. Do you want to come with me? <laughs> actually, but uh, actually, it's five minutes away. So it probably makes uh, inviting friends to church easier, I mean, d- d- depending where, where you live, of course. Um, so th- there are some upsides. But, but you know, I praise God for, for small churches and large churches alike. And, and, and I think you know, God makes both and we need both. Yeah. Yes, I uh, totally agree with you on that, uh, Murray. Uh, another question uh, in light of the increasing opposition or, or, or open hostile uh, opposition, uh, can you comment on how we balance showing love and openness to people and how to stand up for the values that the Bible teaches? Yeah, that's really hard, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it's easy on paper, uh, but uh, in, in real life, it can get very complicated. Uh, I think it helps to remind ourselves each day that we are saved by grace alone. I am a sinner who deserves the wrath of God, but God in his mercy has, has, has redeemed me and forgiven my sins. So I think we need to keep preaching the gospel to ourselves. That helps change the way I, I, I look at other people and view them. And so I don't see them as uh, an enemy or as someone to, to dislike or whatever as, as an opponent, but someone who needs to know Jesus. And so I, I think that's the best thing that we can do. And a second thing we can do is just listen. That the person who is really angry toward you may be really hurting. They might be just an incredibly awful, hateful, spiteful person, but they might be someone who is deep down struggling and hurting. So try to listen, ask questions, ask open questions to try and elicit more information. And, and that can be really helpful as well. And, and, and even by the tone, show that we care for them, show that we want to love them and be gentle with them. Um, and yeah, so that, that, that's the, it's not just what we say, but it's how we say it. It's the motivation, all those things together. And then it's not always going to work. Um, and, and, and social media is, is an awful place to try and do it. It's because it's very hard to communicate on Facebook Facebook and Twitter, misunderstanding. You, we, we misunderstand people who are actually saying good, helpful things, you know, let alone someone is trying to attack us. Um, so be careful how you interact on social media. Mm. Uh, if, if, if you can't do it with grace, then it might be better not to do it at all. Yeah, that's, uh, I can resonate with that. Uh, that's very true, uh, Murray. It's very easy for us to get sucked into uh, debates and uh, and all these arguments in social media and it's good to yeah. uh, get back from that and actually talk to the person face to face and and I like what you say ask good questions listen uh, I think we Christians need to learn to listen more yep. than telling people what we believe that's right I mean the, the way I use social media um, less so Facebook but certainly Twitter and 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 absolutely with my blog it's not for me to have the final say or an, on an issue but rather I'm actually trying to, to communicate a Christian point of view on social issues and ethical issues 
in order to try and stimulate some conversations and the conversations that I can have outside of the blog. And so I have the person who might email me or call me and say, I hated what you said. Can we talk about it? Or that was really interesting. Can I ask a question? And so that the, the beauty of, of, of that is actually the conversations, the real life conversations that one can have outside of that context. And so I'm, I'm often wanting to do that. And, 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 and those conversations do happen, you know, with, with, with gay activists who, who are really angry on Twitter and, and I've had you know, them in my office and we sh and I share in the gospel with them and, and this hearing. It, so it can happen. Um, so, but I, so I'm using my social media in order to try to create those opportunities, if that makes sense. Mm. And, you can do, and people can do it too. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very very helpful, uh, Murray. Thanks for thanks so much for uh, giving a bit more on that. Uh, another question: uh, Any thoughts about um, the dropping ability to or tolerance for reading long form text uh, due to TV or Twitter, and how how will that impact uh, our one to one Bible reading, be it with uh, Christians or also with non Christians? So, any thoughts about about the dropping ability or tolerance for reading long form text and how that impacts our one-to-one -one Bible reading with other people. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know if I've got anything really helpful to say um, other than a lot of generations and cultures have had different issues when it comes to uh, reading, uh, whether it's because they weren't taught to read or, or what, you know, I mean, so if, there are always um, presenting issues and, and, I, and I get the whole thing that, that it's harder to read yet yeah, long uh, texts. I, I, I struggle with it um and for, for different reasons i've got one eye and that doesn't work very well the one that i got so i can't actually read very much text either um so listening to books or i use audio books and i still like to read the scriptures but but i also listen to the scriptures so that, that's another way of, of learning and that's what cultures did for, for millennium didn't that you know for <laughs> hundreds of years before most people could read um but i, I think it's worth trying to train yourself uh, so i think for most of us uh, so each day, spend five minutes reading the Bible and, 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 and just make, sure, make yourself do it. And then over, say, in five minutes every day. And after a week or two weeks, then extend it to six minutes and to seven minutes. So you, get, you can train yourself. You can discipline yourself to improve. Um, to do it with reading the Bible, do it with reading a book. To try not to read on the screen as much. Try to close the screen and, and, and open a book. And, and start short, small, and then try to just build up on that. And I reckon after six months, you'll, you'll, you'll notice a massive difference. Yeah, so give it a go. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I, a while ago, a long time ago, I didn't grow up reading, and, uh, and then I somehow I come across the, the term reading muscle. I didn't know that there's such thing as reading muscle. And they said <laughs> it could be a train, so I thought, okay, maybe. maybe. And, and yeah, true enough that, uh, I love reading much more than well, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, definitely. So there is reading muscle, you can train for it. So thanks, Mario. Absolutely. Uh, another one, uh, in, light of, uh, in light of talking about the gospel conviction, gospel clarity and gospel courage, uh, how should Christians respond to politics and laws that go against the Bible? Um, oh, a few thoughts. Um, not everything we think goes against the Bible does go against the Bible. Uh, so uh, I, 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 I think um, we, we want to be careful not to conflate our political prejudices with um, what the Bible may or may not say. And I think sometimes we, we do do that as Christians. I'm not saying that about the person who's asking the question, but I know, I know that can happen, generally speaking. Um, I think it's important that we follow normal processes that other people would follow in our community if they object to a, a law that's being proposed, you know, which would be to write a polite letter of concern to your local MP, state or federal, and outlining and, and ask, can I come and have a chat about it? And, uh, and so you try to agitate uh, change by going through those sorts of channels. And I think that that would be helpful. Um, you, I'm not one for petitions, but to be honest, um, but I know people do Christians, you know, start petitions, uh, and 
politicians do look at them, especially if there's lots and lots of you know people who, who've signed the petition. Uh, that can be it can be helpful. Um, it could be um, asking your pastor it, uh, for some more information about it. They might be in a position just because of their role or their, their title to, to have a, a more persuasive conversation with someone in, in parliament. Um, I would pray um, and, and hope that you can yeah, convince people, convince the people who are making the, the decisions. Uh, but when a law is passed, I think it's our responsibility to accept it. Um, if the law means I will direct is going to force me to do uh, directly sin, then of course, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to obey God over man. Yeah. Uh, but there are laws which I object to, but they're not going to cause me personally to sin. In which case I accept that the law is in place. I grieve over it. It's part of the world we live in. It's fallen. And, and you hope to God that maybe one day that they change it. Mm, yeah, thanks for that, Murray. Uh, I guess uh, on top of what Murray has said, um, uh, we had a we, we did a roundtable session uh, a couple of months ago uh, about the interaction between church and state. So if you are interested, uh, feel free to send your email to roundtable at crossculture.net.au, and we will uh, pass to you the recording or the link to the recording for that. That might be helpful to add to what Murray has said as well. Uh, another question, this is coming from a campus student ministry leader. Uh, in dealing with this pandemic, some of us in our university Christian organization have realized that we rely too much on events or set times to minister to others. Uh, of course, in church, that can be the same thing as well. Um, like on Sunday, on prayer meeting, on church events, you know. So, however, with this pandemic, we have lost all events to be Christian in. So what do you think are the basics of the gospel that we should turn to? So what would ministry will, uh, will, look, will look like post-pandemic? Um, okay. The, uh, in terms of what one does, it, the answer is going to be different for, say, uni ministry as opposed to a, a church ministry. Um, because by definition, a, a uni ministry doesn't need, doesn't require those students to be in the same place because you're not a church. Uh, whereas a church needs to be by just by definition, you know, of, of what the, the, uh, the, uh, the group is. Um, so could you just, ask, uh, what, what's just give me the question again. Um, so I, I rightly understood it. Um, yep. Uh, so during this pandemic, uh, I guess, well, uh, some of us in our university Christian organization realized that we rely too much on events, yeah. um, to, to minister to others. Um, so how, what, what do you think are the basics of the gospel we should turn to? I'm just thinking maybe it's asking about uh, what are the ministry modes, the basic ministry modes that we should turn to uh, so that we don't rely so much on events. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if the question is assuming this or not, but I think a lot of events are, are kind of superfluous and, and, and uh, unnecessary. I think events can be helpful, really, really helpful. They're not, but most events are not essential. If you're a church, uh, the event that is essential is the, the physical gathering of the people of God on a Sunday every week. Uh, it's, it's the practice since the, the very first church. Again, um, a Christian group at uni is not that, uh, so that's not compulsory. But for a church, it is. Um, other than that, when it comes to a church, um, there is an expectation there is discipleship going on, and that, and that can look like all sorts of things you know I, I, most churches have you know, what, what we call it mentone growth groups and bible study groups you know connect groups whatever the bible doesn't say that you need them so that's an that's an add-on they can be fantastic really really helpful um but it's not something that you have to have but i think so what you do need to have is people discipling other people uh, and and again that it's up to you in your context as to what works best is it one to one, two on one? Having a is it having a Bible study group in your home or in the office at work? Um, using the church facilities, it's all up for grabs. So um, just I, I think figure out what what works in the situation that you've got, so that you can be discipling people. And by discipling, I, I mean that we are reading the Bible with someone, we're teaching the Bible, we're teaching the, 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 and instructing someone so that they grow in their knowledge of God, trusting Jesus. Are growing in uh, holiness, 
and, 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 and they themselves also growing so that they can eventually start discipling somebody else. Um, but yeah, I, I know that union ministry is having to be really creative. We've, we've got a, a bunch of guys who work for AFES and uh, they can't meet on, on campus at all uh, this year. And, and so they're just finding different ways to, to, to do Zoom. And I think they're primarily working with groups of three and threes and fours. It's not even, not, a, not even a big group. So it's, and, 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 the, and the benefit is the discipleship is more intensive and it's more deliberate. And, and the relationship building is even deeper. So, uh, yeah, that's a great thing to do. Mm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely uh, glad that we have Zoom now. Maybe in, in, in 100 years ago, then we might not be able to do Zoom and do in Bible study in, uh, like this using Zoom or using any face to uh, any virtual uh, conference platform. So we certainly thank God for that. Yeah. Uh, following, on, on, following up on the discipleship stuff, um, you, I think the Galatians 4 verse, uh, verse 4 and 5 that you mentioned uh, at the end of your uh, presentation, you said, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. So I'm just thinking, uh, I guess my question is, one, one is in your experience uh, for the past three months or four months, uh, how has the gospel provided the good news for people who are not yet uh, part of the church and how has that been received by, uh, by, by, by non-Christians that you know of or that your members know of and also how can we uh, especially introverts like you and me <laughs> how can we uh, make the most of this opportunity and, and, and how, how would, what, would I, what should I do if I want to start inviting others to read the Bible with me yeah, yeah. great question um, now I've heard that there, there are some churches uh, who are reaching a lot of non-Christians at the moment um, through just friendship networks and different courses they're running. Uh, Mentone is not one of those churches. We're not having lots of people reach out to us and say, tell me more about Jesus. Um, so that's not happening through the church directly. You know, um, One thing that I know is happening, uh, uh, members are sharing that they've had great opportunity just to get to know their neighbors because we're stuck at home uh, and everyone else is, uh, they're getting to know their neighbors. And so conversations have been had and not necessarily lots of, you know, this is the gospel conversation, but, but getting to know people who, who you live next door to. And so, so the pandemic has actually encouraged that. And, and, and I thank God for that. Uh, and, um, what else? So those sort of conversations with neighbours, in fact, it's happening with us, uh, uh, with some neighbours of, of ours. And as soon as we're allowed to, we, we want to have them over for a meal. So that, and that's going to be our next step. Um, for me, I, I, like I, I do a lot of blogging, as we've kind of mentioned, uh, and, and there are always non-Christians reading that material. So I'm trying to, I guess, encourage people to think about the gospel on, on the blog. Uh, next week, we're starting a new course. Um, so... I've written uh, a four week, what is Christianity about course? It's called making sense of Christianity. Um, and I've been wanting to write some material uh, all year because we were planning to start um, at the start or well, early in the year, um, a monthly talks in a community hall when we would bring in an expert who's a Christian and they would be sharing uh, from a Christian perspective, their expertise on, say, climate change or whatever, you know, the, or postmodernism or whatever the issue is. Um, because of the pandemic, we couldn't do that. So I decided to write some material because some the questions people ask today about Christianity are, are different to what they were like 10 years ago. A lot of great courses out there, but they're not always asking the same kinds of questions that people are asking now. And they often run over like eight weeks or 10 weeks. So I've put something together in four weeks and we're starting it next week. And we've got a few non-Christians who are already signed up and love to see more doing it. Um, and, but we'll, we'll be doing that on Zoom. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. So um, maybe one more question. Um, it seems like you, you have been, as, as you have been talking a lot, so <laughs> I just don't want you to get too tired. Uh, just one question. And uh, it says, Mari, in your opinion, how should Christians respond to the Black Lives matter movement now before you answer that um uh, just to uh, let let everyone knows as well that the next round table is actually on the topic of 
uh, Christianity, religions, and also racial reconciliation. So there might be a bit more on that. But uh, I'm just interested also to hear your thought on this, uh, uh, Mari. So in your opinion, how should Christians respond to the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um... A few things that I've been doing. Uh, number one, I've been trying to listen to what uh, some African American brothers and sisters are saying. Um, and I've, that's been helpful for me because I think it's easy in, even in, for, in Australia, regardless of what ethnicity we are, I think it, it's very easy for us to either to jump completely in or to be very standoffish. And, and so I've, I've wanted to take some time uh, to, to listen um, to what they're saying. And that, that's, that, that's helpful. And the Gospel Coalition in America has published a few articles on that and people sharing their stories. So I'd encourage people to look at that. Uh, that's one thing I, I've done. Um, I wrote a piece about racism in general, not Black Lives Matter specifically, uh, to recognise uh, that racism still exists. And now I know there's a lot of arguments, is it systemic racism? Is it just individuals who are racist? You know, and, and I'm trying to avoid a lot of that. I think it's so heated, it's very hard to speak into that context at the moment. So sometimes the best thing to do I know you're not meant to say nothing. Sometimes the best thing to do in, when, when there's so much heat is actually to stand back and, and, and just to think through things carefully before you say anything. Um, so, but to recognize that racism is an issue, even in Australia, where, where, the, where, the, where it's clearly an example of racism, I think we should say, yep, and that is evil and it is wrong and uh, we need to do better. So I think churches have something wonderful to say about it. We've actually got the best news. We've got the best answers on, on, on issues of racism. You know, uh, God has made everyone in, the, in his image. You know, uh, Christianity alone, and well, and Judaism, is, can you believe that, you know? And, and we've got the gospel as well. Uh, and, and so we do want to speak into that issue, but I think before we just give our answers, listen, so we understand the nuances. It's very easy to be polarized. You don't want to be running down one of those, those sort of extreme sort of polar positions because I think they're both wrong and really, really unhelpful. In terms of Black Lives Matter, I don't use the phrase um, because of the organization. I have deep issues with the organization called Black Lives Matter. Uh, but So I don't use the phrase, but I will want to say things uh, about affirming the um, dignity of... of black, brown, yellow people, and to acknowledge when there has been racism. Um, but uh, in Colossians, just before this chapter four, at the end of chapter three, there's a, there's a bit about slavery. And so before I preached on it last week, I sent an email to a, a whole lot of people that I know, especially pastors in America. And I said, what's your take on this passage? Can you give me some, I want, I want to hear what you have to say about it. And so before I preached on it, I actually um, did some, that research by asking around and that was helpful too. Mm, yeah, I think that's, uh, it's very helpful when you say that to separate the issue from the organization. So that's very helpful. Uh, so thank you so much, Mari, for all that you have uh, helped us today as we process all these different issues. Uh, thank you for taking time to prepare and thanking some to us uh, tonight at the round table. So we appreciate your uh, minister, ministry to us. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that's all the time that we have now. So let me uh, close with a few announcements. Um, let me fire up my uh, screen. Uh, the next uh, roundtable, uh, the next roundtable is on the topic of religions, Christianity and racial reconciliation. So is Christianity the only religion that can transcend all races? What about other religions? Uh, does racism or unconscious bias exist in religions or in Christianity? Um, what about Christianity and the past or the present racial-based slavery? Uh, Mari mentioned a bit about that. And what does Christianity have to say to the current Black Lives Matter movement? Uh, Dr. Bernie Power from Melbourne School of Theology is going to help us think through this very relevant issue. So uh, please take time to register and attend our next roundtable on the 19th of August, which is in four weeks time. 
Uh, and also please like our Roundtable uh, Facebook page uh, for more information about the next event and also about Roundtable in general. Uh, we do post articles that we find helpful from time to time. Uh, Roundtable, uh, just to remind you again, the Roundtable is a ministry of Cross Culture Church in Melbourne. So if you want to check us out, if you want to check out Cross Culture Church, uh, please visit our website, crossculture.net.au. Uh, you're welcome to tune in to our regular Sunday service online as well both in English and in Mandarin. And if you live in Melbourne, or if you know anyone who is in need of assistance during this COVID-19 crisis, please uh, please visit crossculture.net.au slash coronavirus. We're more than happy to assist in any way. And if you happen to live uh, near the city area, our chapel is open every Sunday uh, from one o'clock to three o'clock uh, for you to come and uh, get some um, uh, free groceries and free essentials for you to take away and also a few people uh, some people for you to talk with and uh, to have conversation with and if you are a university student uh, we want to invite you to our student ministry at cross culture uh, please visit our facebook page uh, facebook.com slash step cross culture step is the name of the student ministry or uh, you can go to crossculture.net.au slash step Zoom. And uh, finally, as you leave the webinar tonight, you will be redirected to a short feedback form. Uh, we would appreciate if you take the time to fill it out uh, to help shape our future roundtable events. Uh, if you have something uh, constructive to say, please say so. If you have something, if you have, um, if you have a good comment, positive comments to, 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 to say, please say so as well, um, so that we know what's good and what's, what can be improved. And of course, you are welcome to sign up to our newsletter as well uh, using the feedback form. So uh, that's it for tonight. Thank you very much for attending, attending Roundtable. And uh, thank you again for, uh, to Mari for helping us uh, tonight. And please don't forget, uh, check out maricampbell.net. Not Mari Campbell, not Mari, not CampbellSoupForTheSoul.com, but maricampbell.net. So please check it out. Uh, there are lots and lots of good articles for you to, to help you think through how to engage and how to respond to what's happening around the world. So thank you so much, Mari. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much, everyone. We look forward to having you at our next roundtable event. So God bless you and bye for now.